Okay, so, yes. Oh, thanks. Very good. I keep proving yet again I don't have eyes in the back of my head. My mom had my hair kids fooled. She was a sixth grade teacher. Well, maybe you're doing that to make it fancy, you know, the <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's like Princess Bride. Do you think that I think that you think? So, uh, yeah. So last time we talked about rotational spectroscopy and the, and the rotational constant and how it's related to the bond length. So do you remember that? That was Wednesday. Okay. So today we're going to combine that with the vibrational spectrum because that's the more convenient way to measure rotational constants. Uh, you know, microwave spectroscopy is, again, because it's so low energy, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's just a whole nother headache in terms of how, how you um, can do that spectroscopy. We had one microwave uh, uh, spectrometer at Oregon State, and it was a real fidgety, difficult experiment to use. And so it's much easier to use an infrared spectrometer to get row vibrational spectra where you're combining the two. So that's what we have here. Notice the, the strange word, row vibrational. It's rotation and vibration combined. So on top, if you look this, what is the, you know, that potential energy surface, that, that uh, parabola, that's the, the vibrational potential energy surface. And we see the vibrational levels, V, zero, one, two, three, going up, and then on top of those vibrational levels, we have the rotational levels. So J zero through 12 is shown here, okay? And so we're gonna be zooming down into this region because in the mid-infrared, we're looking at fundamental transitions. So that's going from the ground state to the first excited state, which would be zero to one. So we're dealing with a fundamental vibrational transition. And then on top of that, we have the rotations. Now notice that the double prime is the lower state. You know, typically we say prime and double prime, like prime is the first and double prime is the second if you're labeling things. And that was how they started in spectroscopy because they were looking at emission spectroscopy. Okay, so emission, you're starting the first state is the upper state, the second state is the lower state. So we went from prime to double prime and they just kept that. So they kept that, um, that convention that the upper state is the prime and the lower state is the double prime. So that's how we're gonna deal with things. If it seems backwards to you, it's because the original experiments were all emission spec spectroscopy. And so it is backwards now, but we're using absorption. So we're starting in the double prime, going to the prime. So that, that just needs to be ingrained for, in your mind for the rest of the semester, because we'll do that for row vibrational. And then when we get to the iodine lab, we're looking at vibronic, so vibration and electronic combined. And so then it'll be, again, the double prime is the lower state, the prime is the upper state. Okay. <clears throat> so let's look at just a single beam infrared spectrum of air. So we're looking at the emission spectrum of the, of the, uh, the source. So this, this curve here, it goes up and down. Looks kind of like the Planck uh, black body radiator, but backwards. And that's just because we're plotting it um, kind of backwards. Yeah. Um, so anyway, this is the, the black body curve for that hot object. <clears throat> but then there's some dips in it. And so as this light is going through air, uh, some of the light gets absorbed by the species in air. And sure enough, we have um, CO2 vibrations and water vibrations. So in there we have CO2 and water. Uh, you would expect, say, for the asymmetric stretch in CO2 or for the bending motion in CO2, you would expect a single peak, but what you see in the gas phase is a bunch of little peaks on either side. Okay, so up here we have this, this perpendicular band for CO2 where the vibration is perpendicular to the symmetry axis. And so if my head is the carbon and my hands are the oxygens, it's this bending motion here. And, and it's also the bending motion forward and backwards. And so it kind of even could have, if you combine those two, like a pseudo rotation. So the molecule doesn't rotate around the z-axis, but it can have this pseudo-rotation, which is really two vibrations coupled together. And that allows us to have a Q-branch. And we'll get into what these R-branch, Q-branch, P-branch are in a second. But anyway, you see these regular little bumps. Those little bumps are the rotational lines. So it's rotating and vibrating. That's row vibrational spectroscopy. And then over here, so you see the symmetry uh, this, the vibration is perpendicular to the symmetry axis. You see the arrows. 
And then we have the parallel band where the vibration is parallel to the symmetry axis. So this is the asymmetric stretch of CO2. Um, there's no rotational motion at all in that vibration, and so we don't have a Q branch, but we do have a P and an R branch. And again, we'll explain what those P and R branches are. But notice how pretty that is. I mean, it's just a nice little regular pattern of bumps. And every one of those little bumps is a different rotational transition. So we can go in there and we can assign a quantum number transition to every one. We have zero to one always for vibration because it's a fundamental. But then on the rotation, we're going from, say, um, uh, J equals one to two, and then J equals two to three, and three to four, and four to five. So every one of those is a single jump from a J double prime to a J prime that's plus one or minus one. And because this molecule is so symmetric, it has just uh, two has two rotational constants, but they're the same value because it's a symmetric molecule. So these uh, rotational lines are separated by some multiple of that rotational constant. And since it only has uh, really one rotational constant, it's really two, but they're the same value because it's a symmetric molecule, then these peaks line up on each other very nicely. And so it's a very symmetric spectrum and it's very easy to interpret. But look at water. Water has three rotational constants because it's asymmetric. And so then there's three of these patterns on top of each other. And you see water is really confusing. Like there's not a real pretty pattern here, right? Compare these, this sort of mess of lines. There's no intensity pattern that's easily understandable to this, right? Where you just have these really nice, clean rotational lines. And so right there, just from this spectrum, and these clean lines versus the dirty lines in water, we know that water's bent. I mean, water could be linear, right? It could have an oxygen in the middle and two hydrogens and have the same symmetry as CO2. We take a single look at the spectrum of water and air and we know, oh, that can't be because it would look real pretty like CO2 looks and it doesn't, it looks real messy. Um, I've never dug through the math. I've, I've seen the math, it's in Hertzberg's book, for the rotational lines, the pattern in water, there is a pattern there, but it's really difficult to see. You got to get through the, the math and kind of work it out. And I've, I've always wanted to put that in Excel, but it's so ugly, I've never even done it. <laughs> so it's sort of one of my life's goals before I lose my brain cells is to get in Excel and hack through the rotational lines of water so I could predict that ugly pattern. Okay, it's definitely known. I just don't, I just never have hacked through it. Okay, so. We'll see. It's on the video now. You can hold me to it when I'm into my 80s. Like, Dr. Williams, you said. So there's this also this little glitch here. You see these little peaks. If you see a, a peak in, in the, the infrared spectrum like this, it's real. Okay. And this happens to be fingerprints on windows, probably. Right. So that it just means I need to clean my windows. And so that's the little CH stretches in the oily residue off my fingerprints. So you get a little methyl stretch and the CH2 stretches. And anytime you see this little thing in your background spectrum like this, you know your windows have got a little bit of oil on them. Now that's not very much oil at all. So it's not like they're filthy, but you know, a little, um, little ethanol on a Q-tip, very gently, I can clean my windows. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at the, the quantum transitions that give us this spectrum. Okay, so we have this system over here. We've got a vibrating molecule and we have the vibrational uh, levels of V equals zero to one and then the rotational levels on top. So this is the energy level diagram for the row vibrational transitions. Okay, so down at the bottom we have the V equals one level or V equals zero level, V double prime equals zero. And then we also have the J double prime levels of one, two, and three. Zero, one, two, and three. So we have four rotational levels shown here, all on the V double prime equals zero level. So that's pretty straightforward, right? The, the, the J values go up to 50, 60, 100. I mean, they go up. There's, I go, theoretically, there's no limit, okay? Um, there could be hundreds and hundreds of rotational levels. And they can actually go up so high that they go past the V 
uh, double prime equals one state. And so a molecule can get all the way back down to the ground state without emitting light by jumping from vibrational level to another vibrational level at a higher rotation and then bouncing down. Now, technically it's emitting light, but it's emitting light in the, in the, like the microwave region and the, in the far infrared. So it's just giving off heat. So you can hit a, hit a molecule with visible light and excite it. And then it can kind of rattle its way down when we call that non-radiative relaxation. And we'll get into that later when we get into the electronic transitions. But that's we experience that as heat, and so we say it's non-radiative. But heat is infrared. But it's not visible radiation, and so we say it's non-radiative. Then let's go up to the uh, V prime equals 1 level, and then we have the J, the J values on that. So J equals 0, 1, 2, 3. So I'm showing this just because there's limited space. This is as simple as I can make it. Now, remember what's on top. The top is the energy level diagram. Okay, that word level is super important, okay? Because remember our mantra on Wednesday, let's say it again. Transitions are differences in energy levels, right? So you have the energy level diagram, and what do you have for a transition? You have a difference. So these arrows are showing you the two energy levels that are combined. And notice down at the bottom, we have the spectrum. The spectrum is the spectral lines that are the differences. Those bottom is the transitions, the spectral lines, which are the differences in the energy levels. So we can have up here, <coughs> delta J equals zero, and delta V equals plus one. So this is what we're doing right now. These green lines are the zero and the plus one. And all of these are going to be delta V plus one. And the minus one would be emission. And so we're just going up. So we're doing only the V delta V plus ones. And, and these notice that these are going to all be the same, uh, the same difference or the same length, I would say. This is going J0 to J0 and V0 to 1. This one's going J1 to 1 and V0 to 1. And this is going J2 to 2 at V0 to 1. So these are all basically the, the difference between the delta Vs. There's really no difference in delta J because delta J equals 0. So these will all show up at the same spot in the spectrum, and that's what we call the Q branch. It's a really tall peak if you have it. It's a really tall peak. And let me just let me back up. I'll show you the Q branch on, on the CO2. See right here, this really tall peak? That's the Q branch. That's the delta J equals zero. And that's the, the vibrational difference in that, in that molecule. See how much taller it is than all the other rotational lines? I say tall, but these are absorbing and, and they're going down, but it's just the peaks are going down because we're using a single beam spectrum. Okay, so here we go back to this. All right, so those show up down at the, in, the, in the spectrum as a really tall, skinny peak. We call that the Q branch. Um, now let's look at the, the delta J plus ones. And so now we're doing the plus one peaks right here. So this is starting at, at J equals the J double prime equals zero to J prime equals one. See how that's a delta J plus one. Okay. And a delta V plus one. So both of them are plus one. We went up in a V and we went up in a J. Okay. We could have started at the J equals one and gone to two. Okay, that's still a J plus one, delta J plus one, and a delta V plus one. We just started in a different rotational space, a different rotational state. And then we could go two to three, and then I've run out of levels, so I can't display anymore. But, you know, it goes on. Okay. And those are separate, those are, those are different, um, different energies. Look how the J values go up as J squared. And so notice how going from zero to one, that arrow is a certain length, okay? Going from one to two, okay? I went up a little bit for one, but I went up a lot further going from one to two. 
And so this arrow is slightly longer and it shows up at a higher wave number value in the spectrum. And so these rotational lines are not on top of each other. They're spaced out in the spectrum. So notice all of these Q lines were right there. All of those were at the same frequency. But notice each individual one of these lines is separated in the spectrum because of the difference in the J values. See, the, the upper state J value went up further than the lower one did. And so that arrow is a little bit stretched. And that means it shows up at a higher frequency. <coughs> and then we could do the delta J minus ones. So these will be um, delta J equals minus one. So we can start in one and go to zero. We can't start in zero for this series because it can't go to minus one. There are no negative rotational quantum numbers, or at least yeah, in this particular example. So it can't start at zero and go to minus one, but it can start at one and go down to zero, or it can start in two and go down to one, or it can start in three and go down to two. Notice now we've got, um, in going from the yellow one to the orange one, the the arrow got much shorter because this, this jump is bigger than this jump, right? So you see how that shrunk the arrow. And if it's a shorter arrow, it's a lower wave number transition. And so all three of these would be separated in the spectrum. And so that's where we see this regular pattern of rotational lines in the spectrum. And so we call that the P branch, the middle one is the Q branch, and then the higher wave number one is the R branch. So PQR in alphabetical order going to higher frequency. So P is the lowest one, Q is in the middle, and R is the higher frequency one. So you see down here, wave number goes up going to the right. So this is big and this is small. <laughs> I'll write it, write it like the internet does it, S-M-O-L. Okay, so this is a PQR, and those are the P branches are the delta J minus ones, and the R branches are delta J equals plus one. Q branch, delta J equals zero. Any questions so far? We're going to actually assign a spectrum in the lab, not this, week, not this next week, but the following week. Okay, let's look at the um, um, just some, some of the facts about the infrared spectroscopy. Remember, it's a sum of the vibration and rotational energy equations. And so here's the energy equation. It has two quantum numbers. It has vibration and rotation. And it's just the sum of the vibrational energy equation and the rotational energy equation. Here's the vibration energy equation. This is, this is V here. That's why I said the font kind of makes it look like a new but that's a V, that's the quantum number. This is the vibrational frequency. Um, here's the rotational quantum number J. So we add those together and that's what produces the energy level diagram. So energy equation gives you the energy levels. Okay. And then if you take these selection rules, <clears throat> you can put those in so you can have the, the, the you know, to get the transition equations, you can take the E of V plus one comma J uh, plus one and subtract E of V and J. And you can get that transition equation for the delta J plus ones. And you could do all of that for all three possibilities. And here are the transition equations that you get. <coughs> Let me just re-emphasize, you have the energy equation, which gives you the equation for the levels. What does the transition equation give you? It's in the name. It's the frequencies of the transitions, right? So the transition equation is the horizontal axis of the spectrum. So it's actually what you measure. And that was that last question on the last test. So I said, you have the fundamental transition is so and so many uh, nanometers. You know, I give you the wavelength. And you were to convert that into the into the um, physical constants, the mass of the particle. You needed to use a transition equation, not the energy equation. 
or use the difference in the energy equations. You know, you could have started there, but but many people just use the energy equation as is, and that doesn't give you the difference in energy. It's the difference in energy that you see in the spectrum. So here's the P branch. Notice it's the um, <clears throat> that V plus one, but delta J minus one, and then you subtract the energy equation. And so you see this is the difference that you get for the transition, and here's the equation based upon the quantum numbers. Okay, so um, we have it in terms of the J quantum number. The V quantum numbers are zero to one, so they, they've all canceled out. So we, we have, this is the vibrational frequency, and then this is the rotational constant and the, and the J quantum number. Then for the Q branch, if you, if you do that, notice how the, the J values didn't, didn't change. And so the rotational piece just cancels out. And we just have the, the vibrational frequency, which is that difference in energy levels. And then for the R branch, we take the, the J plus one, and we subtract the energy equation, which is plain old J, and we end up with this transition equation. And here's your rotational energy, a uh, rotational quantum number. So these are the three uh, equations you have for the P branch, the Q branch, and the R branch. And it shows you that the Q branch shows, right up, shows up right on the uh, vibrational uh, frequency difference. So here's what we have. Let me erase my marks. Just from the previous slide, you saw that. So this equation, if you'll notice that um, the R branch is going to be labeled, that first R branch line is the 0 to 1, because the R branch is delta J plus 1, so it's going from starting at 0, going up to 1, and it's separated by, by 2B. So if we put in 0 here, this piece cancels, and we have the vibrational frequency plus 2b. So that's, that's what's being shown here. It's, it's two times the rotational constant away from the vibrational frequency. And then going to uh, 1 to 2, we would put a 1 in here for j, and we get another unit of 2b. So it's going to be 4b away from the vibration, which is 2b two, two steps, right? And then when we go to uh, j equals 2 up to 3, we would put a 2 in here, and so we would have 2b for the first one, and then 4 more for that, so it would be 6 over. So from the vibrational frequency, that line shows up 6 times the rotational constant at a higher wave number value. And so if we were to take this spectrum and, and identify the frequencies for each of these peaks, the separation in those peaks is related to the to the rotational constant, and that's related to the bond length and the mass of the particle. If we look at the P branch, notice we can't start at zero. We have to start at one because we're going down. So this one starts at, at one and goes to zero. Okay, so that's like one double prime to zero prime. And this is zero double prime to one prime. We could put primes on those if you wanted, just to show that it the lower state is rotational quantum state zero, the upper state is rotational quantum state one. Okay, this one now, the lower state is, is one. So it's in the V equals zero state, and it's up just a little bit in the first rotational state. And it's going to V equals one and the rotational state zero. So it's going down in rotation, even as it goes up in vibration. And so then this next one would be uh, two double prime going to one prime. And notice as we put in uh, those quantum numbers, so J equals one, it's the vibrational frequency minus 2B. If we put in a two there, it's going to be the vibrational frequency minus 4B. So you see it jumps over tw uh, twice as far. And then the, they put a three in, it goes over 6B. And so every one of those rotational lines is spaced by a constant value that rotational constant. Um, it, bother, it bothers me that these are this, these are like visually not exactly the same. <laughs> so if that's bothering you, it's bothering me too. Like I, I just didn't draw it as accurate. This peak should be over a little closer to this one because you see that looks like a bigger gap than those gaps. I'm sorry. I just, it's just as good as I could do at the time. Okay. So 
Let, let's before we leave infrared absorption and go to Raman. Are there any questions about this? This is everything that we like. This is all the theory for the infrared row vibrational spectrum. Is there anything that confused you? Now's the time to clear it up. I'll just reemphasize this, these transition equations give us the horizontal axis of the spectrum. So that tells you where my peaks are. So if we identify in a real spectrum where those peaks are, we can fit that identification to this equation and solve for B. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to solve for B, and then we're going to transform that into a bond length and a, and a mass. Okay. okay, so then let's look at Raman. So Raman, we come in with the visible photons of light, and they scatter, and we take the difference in those scattered photons, and we get the infrared and, and, and rotational information. So notice we have that virtual state and the scattered photon comes down. So it's a two photon process. We analyze the scattered photons, we subtract the laser wave number, and we get the same kind of thing. But we have different selection rules. Notice now we have delta J plus or minus two. Everything's the same, but our delta J is different. So I'm just showing you the change in the molecule. I'm not showing you the up and down photons. But remember, this is the difference, and this is what we would plot in the spectrum. So we still have a Q branch. Okay. Now we're going to do delta J plus 2. So we start at 0. We skip 1. We go to 2. So 0 to 2. So that, see how it's the longer arrow. And then we start at 1, and we can go to 3. And then that's all I can show, because I only have three uh, or four rotational levels. So that shows this branch down here. They're separated further because we have bigger differences when we have a delta J plus two. And we could do the delta J minus two. I could start at two and go to zero. I can't start at one because I can't go to negative numbers and I can't start at zero because I can't go to negative numbers. So the very first line on this branch starts at two and goes down to zero. Then we can start at three and go down to one. And those are called O Q and S branches because they're further out than the P and the R. So it's still alphabetical. The Raman is an O branch. Then you have an IR P branch. Then everything has a Q branch if it's allowed by the vibration. Then you have the R branch and then the Raman S branch. So the P and R are only in the infrared absorption. The O and S are only in the Raman and the Q can be in either one. So let's look at the uh, transition equations for the Raman. So this is the same kind of slide, but the difference is the transition equations in Raman shift. So this is the difference between the incident and scattered photons um, is Raman shift. So we take that V plus one and subtract V, and we take the J minus two and subtract J, and we end up with this particular transition equation for the O branch. The Q branch is the same. It's still the vibrational frequency. And then the S branch is that plus 2, J plus 2, minus the energy with J, and we end up with this transition equation. So up here in the spectrum, the 0 to 2 uh, line, so we put a 0 in here for, for J. So this piece is gone. So it's the vibrational frequency plus 6b. So it's 6b higher in wave number than the vibrational frequency. Then when we put a 1 in here for j, we have 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it jumps up to 10b, and so that's a difference in 4b. If we put a 2 in here, then we're going to get 4 more b. And so the spacing in the Raman spectrum is 4b, four times the rotational constant between our peaks. Let's look at the, the uh, O branch. So if we put in a 2 
put a two in here. It's um, it's the vibrational frequency plus two B, but minus uh, four B times two, which is eight. So plus two minus eight is still a change in six. So it goes down minus six B lower than the vibrational frequency. Then when we put in a three here, okay, so we put in three for the next one. And so it goes up to and, and down uh, 12. So the difference is 10, which means it shifts over by another four. So six and four is, is 10. And now every time we, we add in another J value, if we go up to four, again, it's gonna subtract four B every time. So our rotational lines in the Raman spectrum are separated by four B. Our rotational lines in the infrared are separated by two B. So it's gonna um, depend upon which spectrum you have in terms of finding that rotational constant. So this sort of sets up a joke I like, the Hamlet ponders to be or not to be, and uh, you have different cases. So DW says if it's absorption, the answer is 2B, and if it's Raman, the answer is 4B. Okay. So there I have the answer to Hamlet's age-old question. So a corny joke, but it'll help you remember. And so if you've got uh, in, a, in a problem, if you're given two rotational lines in the Raman and you want to solve for the bond length, you take that difference between those rotational lines and you take that frequency difference and you divide by four and you've got the rotational constant. Then you can use the equation for that rotational constant to find the bond length or, or the mass of the particle or whatever it is you're trying to find. Okay. So here's your carbon monoxide spectrum. It's an absorption spectrum, and so the difference in those rotational lines is, is two times the rotational constant. Look at how many peaks you have. Now, it's a really tedious part of the lab, is to go through and assign quantum numbers to every one of those peaks, okay? But that's good for statistics. So think about uh, how we determine um, unknowns, right? If you have a perfect system and you have two unknowns, you need two equations, right? If you have two equations and two unknowns, you can solve for those unknowns, but you have no statistics, right? Is it's an exact solution. And one of those equations might have a little bit of noise in it, but you wouldn't know that because you just have one answer. You have the two equations, you can solve for two unknowns, and you don't know about any statistics. What if you have three equations and two unknowns? Now, you're gonna get multiple answers for those unknowns. What do you do with that? Well, you could take the average and standard deviation. If you have four values, four equations, and two unknowns, you get better statistics. We only have one unknown in this spectrum, that's B, the rotational constant. And look at how many peaks we have. Every one of those peaks is an equation, because we have that transition equation. Every peak is an equation, and we have one unknown. So we have incredible statistics in this spectrum. So if we, if we assign every one of these peaks and we solve for B using all of those equations to solve for one unknown, we're going to have really good statistics on its plus or minus value. Okay. And in fact, we can see that um, these peaks out here are a little bit farther apart than these peaks right here. Can you see the difference? So in, in fact, we could get some other parameters out there. Maybe there's other unknowns that we could solve for. Like if I take a molecule and it's spinning and I increase its quantum number, it spins faster. And if I really increase its quantum number, it spins faster. What's gonna happen to those atoms as they spin faster and faster and faster? They're gonna wanna fly apart a little bit. The bond length's gonna stretch. What keeps it from flying apart is that vibrational spring constant. So the vibrational spring is holding it together but the spinning is causing it to stretch. It's kind of like a centrifuge. And so they call it centrifugal distortion. <laughs> okay, so it's pulling the bond apart and changing the bond length just a little bit and making B change. And so that's the centrifugal distortion. And we have so many equations here. Let's solve for that unknown too. Because now we have two, we can put in two unknowns and we can solve for the B value and the centrifugal distortion constant. So that's really cool. And we do that. Diatomics can't have a Q branch because there's no way to have a perpendicular stretch in a, in a diatomic. So, so that's why the Q branch is missing. 
Now, how do we identify which is the branches, the P branch and the R branch? Remember the R branch um, is on the high side. Right, high meaning high values of wave numbers. And so whether you get your spectrum and plot it this way, or you plot it the more traditional way where the high wave number values are to the left, here now the, the P branch is on the right and the R branch is on the left. So you have to look to see which is the high side of wave numbers. So if you look at the X axis and the, the high values for the wave numbers are on the left, then that's the R branch and the P branch is on the low wave number side. So let's do a sample calculation. <clears throat> we've gone through in the lab in two weeks, we've peaked all our, picked all our peaks. We've got a table of frequency values. We've assigned quantum numbers to those and we've solved for B. So here's B, our rotational constant, and here's our bond length buried in the basement, okay? So how do we get to that rotational constant? We've got to cancel all the units. This is, we want this in angstroms and B is going to be calculated in wave numbers. So we've got a whole bunch of conversion factors to go. We've, we've got a conversion that gets out of angstroms and in the meters, so it'll cancel with this meter in the Planck's constant. We've got grams to kilogram conversions because we've got the molar mass or the reduced mass of, of say, carbon monoxide in terms of grams per mole. Um, the per mole needs to be canceled by Avogadro's number, okay? And we want wave numbers because, uh, because that's what B is measured in. And so we have the speed of light with an extra two zeros to give us centimeters per second. Okay. So we've got all of these things. But notice that all of these things are constants except for my reduced mass and my bond length. Right? If I give you a different molecule, you've changed the reduced mass, but you haven't changed the speed of light or Avogadro's number or Planck's constant or how many grams are in a kilogram. So make it make life easy on yourself and consolidate all of that garbage into one big constant right <clears throat> so that every time you do one of these calculations you can just use 16.8576314 grams per mole angstrom squared wave numbers and the reduced mass in grams per mole and the and the bond length in angstroms and then that will convert over to a bond a rotational constant in wave numbers so this, I would say, is note card bait, <laughs> right? Because why do this on an exam up here at the top, right? You're going to make a mistake. You're going to say times 10 to the minus 34 or 33 or something. You're going to screw something up with the scientific notation. Most of the time, that's where people make their mistakes. And so if you can consolidate all that mess, this is easy to type in 16.857, etc. Okay. And then in the lab, I would say... Be sure to use all the sig figs because in lab you're spending all your time tediously picking these peaks and you want to make sure that you don't throw away your precision by just using Planck's constant as 6.63 or something like that. that. That would be ridiculous to have three significant figures in a constant that really has seven or eight. Okay, so here's an example calculation. So this would be a, a typical type problem. You've got the S branches in a Raman spectrum of, of uh, difluoride uh, are 3.56 wave numbers apart. What's the bond length? So you could go to the periodic table, look up the masses. You could calculate um, the reduced mass. So here the individual mass of fluorine is 38 grams per mole. Taking that into uh, M1, M2 over M1 plus M2. When they're the same masses, you end up with M1 squared over 2M1. So one of the M's cancels with the square, and so you have M1 over 2. And so that's, that doesn't seem to work out, does it? Yeah, 1.5, 38. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I may have a mistake here, but let's, let's go on with the problem. Um, so then we put in that reduced mass here for, for mu, we have our note card constant, and we solve for the bond length. So let's rearrange this to solve for the bond length. It's the square root of this note card constant divided by the reduced mass 
and divided by the rotational constant. Now, this is the key here and the reason I did the whole Hamlet thing. This right here is in a Raman spectrum. And so B is equal to 3.56 divided by 4 because those spectral lines are 4B apart. The reason I emphasize this so much is that this is one place where units won't help you. Right? There's no unit conversion going on here. I just have to know that my Raman lines are separated by 4B. It's the same units. So whether I divide by 4 or not, it's the same units. And so you will not know that you've made a mistake by the units. So that's why I make such a big deal out of this. Okay? And so, um, so down here we have that 3.56 divided by 4. That's the rotational constant. We put in all the other numbers, and we end up with a reasonable bond length of 1.41 angstroms. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Oh, that's it. This is the mass of the whole molecule, right? And so the mass of just one fluorine is 19, which is 9.5. It's 19 divided by 2 is 9.5. So there's not a mistake here. I just was looking at 38 and thinking 9.5 is not 38 divided by 2. <laughs> yeah, so. <clears throat> okay. Now for your carbon monoxide lab, you're probably, since it's two weeks from now, going to have to come back to this video. But let me go ahead and talk you through it so that you can come back to this video. So um, you can, like, I don't know, maybe you don't have to write much down now. Just wait until we get to the lab, come back to this video. But here's your spectrum. The main level of effort in this is twofold. One is peak picking the spectrum, and the other is the, the linear regression that we do. So if we, if we want to assign this spectrum, we know that the very first P branch line is P1, because a P branch is delta J, the P branch is delta J minus one. So we have to start at one going down to zero. And so then the next one is uh, the, the first R branch line, R branches are delta J plus one. And so we can start at zero there and go up to one. <clears throat> we know the R branch is on the high frequency side. The next P branch is P2, then P3, then P4, all the way up. We get to like P25, okay? You might be able to go to 26 or 27. Go as far as you can until it looks like you're just picking noise. Don't pick any noise, but pick the le last one that you're confident in. And that's a judgment call. That's the, that's the freedom you have in the lab. It's trying to get those higher lines. Don't start at, Don't stop at 20 or 21. You'll actually get counted off on that. So go as high as you can and until you feel like you might be picking noise and then just stop, okay? Then the R0, R1, R2, R3, all the way up. This is where it really gets tricky because the carbon monoxide spectrum starts to collide with the carbon dioxide spectrum. So these are CO2 peaks and they're dying out. So if, you're, if your peaks are getting smaller and smaller and then they start getting bigger and bigger, you're on the wrong molecule, <laughs> okay? And so it really gets kind of, you have to use your judgment here to see is it, is it the appropriate distance from the last peak and is it the appropriate height and, until you sort of get less confident then you can stop, okay? Now in this lab, it would be nice to do one regression. We don't want to do a regression on the P branch and a regression on the R branch. We'll get two values of B, which one's the most reliable. So we come up with this fake quantum number, M. And so we redefine this. It's really just for our linear regression. For the R branch, we say M is equal to J plus one. And then for the P branch, we say M is minus J. And you can see how this helps down here if we zoom in at the bottom. We see for the R0 line, that's M equals plus one. And for the P1 line, that's M equals minus one. And the intercept where M goes through zero is the vibrational frequency, nu zero, okay? So this, this sort of fake quantum number is just a, a nice tool we use for the linear regressions. You have a lab handout from the Nibbler book in this lab, and he has this equation, this transition equation based on M. And he has you doing a regression based upon M, M squared, and M cubed, where these are your columns of your regression. 
but I've rearranged this and say, don't use the Nibbler equation, use mine right here from this video, okay? You're using t an e a column with 2m, a column with this mess here, minus 2m minus m squared, and a column with m cubed. And this is your centrifugal distortion constant. This is your rotational constant, your vibrational frequency, and this rotation vibration coupling constant. So you'll solve for four unknowns with all of these peak picked equations. And we do that with a with a, a what's called a linear regression. And there's a video on the on Blackboard tutorial on linear regressions. And so that's setting you up for the lab in two weeks. Okay. And then there's a propagation of uncertainty part in this lab too. And so there's video on there on propagation of uncertainty. Watch that one as well in preparation for this lab. All right. See you next time. Have a safe weekend. Thank you.